Thank you for joining the Sleep Stakehold community today for this educational briefing on challenges and opportunities in sleep circadian and sleep disorders research. Recently, the National Institutes of Health released a comprehensive sleep research plan, and today we will look forward to learning more about priority areas and upcoming innovation. My name is Dr. Numni Goyle, and I am president-elect of the Sleep Research Society, or SRS. I also serve as the liaison to the SRS Advocacy Task Force and was the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, which I am delighted to report has now become a permanent standing committee of the SRS. There are too many professional societies and patient organizations to list in the brief time we have available all who are helping me host this briefing today. Over recent years, the sleep portfolio at the National Institutes of Health has doubled in size as a result of strong advocacy, innovative research, including a Nobel Prize in medicine, and sustained investment by Congress. The community is committed to ensuring sleep research is well-resourced and that the new plan can be fully implemented. In this regard, we thank the legislators who continue to support science and fully fund research. One of the community's champions on Capitol Hill is Congressman Zoe Lofgren of California. Congressman Lofgren leads the ZZZs to A's School Sleep Start Time Legislation and also is the co-chair of the Congressional Sleep Health Caucus. She joined us by a pre-recorded statement today to help open this event. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, representing California's 19th Congressional District. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual briefing on advancing the science of sleep. Throughout the past two years, we've all been dealing with the unique challenges and added stress brought on by the COVID pandemic and the necessity of good quality sleep has become more uh, glaring. The anxieties around employment, health risks, uncertainties about what the future holds have undoubtedly impacted our sleep patterns and exacerbated sleep disorders. Because of the pandemic, the National Institute of Health's new sleep research plan couldn't have come at a more appropriate time. NIH has been making tremendous strides in an effort to enhance our understanding of sleep and circadian rhythms. These developments will lead to improved sleep health, we believe, and breakthroughs in the diagnosis and treatment of sleep disorders. The NIH Sleep Research Plan represents a comprehensive vision for the next generation of sleep medicine and addresses important topics, including how sleep impacts mental well being, resilience to disease, and social determinants of health and public safety. So we all look forward to hearing from NIH's newly appointed director of the National Center for Sleep Disorders Research, Dr. Marishka Brown, about her vision, uh, the plan, and its implementation. You know, in Congress, my colleague, Congressman Rodney Davis and I have established the bipartisan Congressional Sleep Health Caucus to show uh, and to draw attention to sleep research and the importance of following sound science. We look forward to continuing to work with the sleep science community uh, to improve public health and enhance care for patients. The ongoing work at NIH, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Veterans Affairs allows us to make informed science-based policy decisions related to topics such as school start times, daylight savings time, drowsy driving, and more. Now, I'm sure you want to hear from Dr. Brown, but before turning it back over to the MC, I want to thank the Health and Medicine Council for inviting me today. Thank you for your work, and thank you for joining us and for all your efforts to raise awareness about and to improve sleep health. Also joining us by video today is the other co-chair of the Congressional Sleep Health Caucus, 
Congressman Rodney Davis of Illinois. He has some brief welcome remarks as well. I'm Congressman Rodney Davis, co-chair of the Congressional Sleep Health Caucus, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining this briefing. This briefing's on recent developments in sleep research from the National Institutes of Health. Good sleep is critical to our overall health, but something that really often goes overlooked. I'm proud to raise awareness for this important issue of sleep health in Congress. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to participate in this discussion today. This is something that affects everyone, and there are many opportunities across agencies to promote good sleep health policy. We must continue our work to advance a scientific understanding of sleep and the impact of sleep on public health. Together, we can push good policies that help fund the research and initiatives we need that prioritize sleep health and, in turn, better overall health. I look forward to further discussions on the NIH's new plan and the innovation that can come from it. Together, we can continue to advocate for good policies that help support this aspect of healthy living. Thank you to all participants and each of the speakers today. Finally, we have a statement from Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland. Congressman Raskin represents the National Institutes of Health and the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research. He is a strong champion for annual research funding and science-based policy. Good afternoon, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District, which includes the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and specifically its National Center for Sleep Disorders Research. Um, and uh, therefore, I am the Congressman from NIH, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual briefing where we're gonna hear from the Center for Sleep Disorders Research Director, Dr. Mariska Brown, about the NIH's new sleep research plan. Over recent years, NIH, along with other federal research efforts, including uh, DOD and the VA, have been making great progress in sleep circadian rhythm and sleep disorder research. Recent advancements even produced a 2017 Nobel Prize in medicine for sleep research breakthroughs. Uh, I'm proud to work with my colleagues in Congress to ensure that NIH is being properly supported on an annual basis in this research. The uh, FY22 spending bill still pending at this time includes a robust investment of an additional 3.5 billion for NIH. And this is in addition to another 3 billion that Congress is working with the uh, Biden administration to provide for the new Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health or ARPA-H. The additional funding is badly needed as many patients affected by a diverse array of sleep disorders have few treatment options and um, even a difficulty just being seen and being diagnosed. NIH's new research plan for sleep is well-timed and should continue the ongoing progress in this area that will take us into real breakthroughs, real breakthroughs in the future of sleep medicine. In this regard, I'm pleased to see that the plan includes a specific focus on addressing health disparities given the great impact that sleep disorders have on underserved communities. Thanks again for your time today, for being part of this, and to all of our speakers, thank you for your ongoing work to promote and to improve sleep research. I look forward to working with the stakeholder community, including the, everybody in attendance today, to support your efforts moving forward. All best. Our first presenter today is Dr. Mariska Brown, the director of the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research at the National Institutes of Health. While she only recently took the helm as director, Dr. Brown first joined NCSDR in 2016 and has dedicated her career to biomedical research that, that positively impacts health and safety for everyone. Dr. Brown will be presenting on the key elements of the new National Institutes of Health Sleep Research Plan. As NCSDR prepares to celebrate its 30th anniversary, the plan very much reflects a new vision for sleep research that will advance the cutting edge of medicine for this field. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brown. 
Nominee, thank you so much for that introduction. And before I get started, I really do want to thank our representatives, uh, Congresswoman Lofren and, and Congressman Davis for their leadership of the Sleep Health Caucus, as well as uh, Congressman Raskin for his uh, support of the Sleep Health Caucus and Sleep and Circadian Research, because uh, as everyone knows, Congress appropriates the funds. And so to be able to uh, engage them in, the, in Sleep and Circadian Research is, is a highlight, and we're very excited for their support and for uh, their messages that were sent. So let's dive in. So as everyone uh, on the call hopefully knows, the new uh, Sleep Research Plan was launched in December of 2021, and we are so excited because it was an effort from all of our stakeholders, from the researchers to the medical community, to the patient advocates, to the people who are just interested, because Everyone sleeps. It's support. Everyone sleeps, and it's important uh, for everyone. And so, jumping into the presentation. So, uh, as everyone on the call hopefully is familiar with, you know, we talk about these three pillars of health. Nutrition and physical activity have long, long been recognized as pillars. Of pillars of optimal health promotion. However, the research has clearly shown that sleep is required for overall health and well-being and that poor sleep impacts both your physical and your mental health. And so sleep strongly fits in that place. You cannot uh, have a conversation about optimal health without thinking about uh, these three equal pillars of health. And so, as most of you may know, our office, the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research, is congressionally mandated, and our mission includes the support of research, and that includes training, as well as coordination of the activities of the center with similar activities, not only across NIH, but across multiple components of the federal government. It also includes the education of the public and the research communities uh, about that research and the things that are happening in the center and in that space that are relevant uh, for all of us. So the NCSDR um, exists, again, because of the very, very strong advocacy of the sleep research communities. And uh, the community really did lean into Congress to make this a national discussion. Uh, in addition to the support of research, the coordination, the dissemination of the health information, we are also tasked with the development of a comprehensive research plan. And this plan was developed with input from you all on the phone, uh, on this virtual meeting. And we are very, very excited and thankful uh, for your continued support and input. And so to accomplish this, uh, the center has a federal advisory board, the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board. And you will hear uh, from our current chair today, Dr. Gabby Haddad and Ms. Alexandra Wharton, who is also a member of uh, the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board will also be presenting. And so our advisory board really is uh, created to advise, uh, assist, and consult and make recommendations on scientific directions and activities and priorities that are carried out by the NCSDR. And so sleep and circadian research are funded across NIH. Uh, NCSDR is the coordination hub, but again, multiple components uh, support your research. And to give you a picture of the landscape, uh, currently there are 21 institute centers and offices across NIH that are supporting sleep and circadian research. And funding in this area has steadily increased over the years. And that could be attributed to the e evolving profile and the growing areas of sleep and circadian in research, including into uh, research in the health of women and maternal health, minority health and health disparities, uh, substance abuse and pain research, aging, where the National Institute on Aging, their uh, portfolio for sleep and circadian research has grown exponentially over the past few years, as well as research into the immune system. Uh, and so, as you can see, the numbers uh, have only been uh, closed for 2020. Uh, the numbers for 2021 are still estimated, but we should have those final numbers this spring or summer. And since the inception of, of NCSDR, NIH has supported over $3 billion for sleep and circadian research. And something uh, for everyone to keep in mind is that 80% of the NIH budget is actually investigator initiated. And so 
again, mentioning part of our uh, activities are coordination. And so coordination, again, is a primary mandate of the center. And NCSDR coordinates uh, within the NIH with our Trans-NIH Sleep Research Coordinating Committee, which is comprised of program officials uh, across NIH who hold sleep and circadian research in their portfolios. But we also coordinate with other federal agencies, including the Department of Defense, the Department of Transportation, uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department Department of Energy and several others. In addition, we have our previously mentioned Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board, and those meetings are essentially the premier venue where the community, the researchers, the professionals, the stakeholders, uh, the government agencies, they come and exchange uh, ideas on what needs to be done. And that information has uh, been recorded in the new sleep research plan. And so speaking of said plan, if you have not gone to our pages, there's a link drop down. Please go and explore. Uh, there is a PDF, but it was really designed as a digital first strategy. So go in and explore the pages and let us know what you think. Uh, you can reach out to us uh, to, to let us know how we did. We want to hear from the community. So the NIH Sleep Research Plan is a starting point. It really is laying the scientific foundation for sleep health and sleep and circadian research that contributes to the mission of many federal agencies. I mentioned uh, uh, the Department of Transportation, where they're interested in performance and safety, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, they're interested in readiness, HUD, uh, the they define a dwelling as a place where you sleep. And so when you think about these, there are many, many opportunities uh, for the research community uh, to engage and for coordination. And so this new plan focuses on the next five plus years and includes activities uh, across the research spectrum, the entire research spectrum, uh, because that discussion is needed to promote sleep and circadian advances. Uh, in addition to advancing the scientific knowledge and transforming healthcare, uh, advancing well being and improving public health and safety, as you can see in the center, is fostering a strong and diverse workforce. Because without that workforce, uh, all of the scientific advances and all of the things that we want to do, it cannot happen without the people uh, to do it. And so I wanted to just lay the groundwork. These five goals uh, that are in the plan are essentially the backbone of the new NIH sleep research plan. Uh, the goals, again, they reflect the spectrum of sleep and circadian research from basic biology uh, to clinical research and clinical trials, uh, again, to focusing on the development of the workforce. And again, uh, I cannot harp on this enough because this diverse workforce uh, is included first, uh, is inclusive of both underrepresented groups and the diversity in scientific background and perspective. So uh, when we speak about coordination, I wanted to talk about some of the activities that have been happening. So uh, every, uh, if you have not uh, known, if you do not know, uh, sleep, sleep disturbances, fatigue, uh, difficulty breathing, they are all symptoms that have shown up uh, in people who have experienced COVID and the post-acute sequelae. And so for coordination in the, of the science, we actually put on a workshop uh, this in the summer of 2021 to identify research directions in sleep and circadian biology. There were several institute centers and offices uh, that were involved and the goal was to really discuss uh, critical findings and to identify scientific questions for basic and clinical research and really to explore the societal impact uh, for about sleep and the COVID-19 pandemic. In uh, addition to that, we coordinated with the National Child Health Institute, with the National Institute on Child Health and Human Development, uh, as well as the National Institute on Aging uh, to put on a, a, an, an event, a Facebook Live event uh, for sleep across the lifespan. Uh, all of these activities, they really do elevate the science of sleep and circadian research. In addition, uh, we actually worked with, uh, there was a joint workshop actually organized by uh, the National Center on Sleep Dis Disorders Research uh, with 
the, uh, the, Academy, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, as well as the Sleep Research Society, where we talked about sleep and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that was very well attended. And actually the NIH record picked up that stuff picked up that story. Uh, and another activity with the SRS and the NIH blueprint was really about exploring uh, going beyond the symptom, the biology of fatigue. And the objective of this workshop uh, was to really discuss how fatigue is described and measured across diseases with the goal of identifying uh, the commonal commonalities and features of fatigue. Uh, in addition to that, we've been working uh, for the past several months on uh, uh, our engagement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. There was actually a webinar in November of 2020 where we uh, had a discussion about sleep and cardiovascular disease as, relate, as it relates to housing. So NCSDR is currently focusing on housing, sleep, and risk to health, as this area is really is ripe for exploration, and the research that is generated by the sleep community has provided the opportunities for these conversations. And in the past, much of the focus on HUD uh, was to protect the asset, was to protect the property. However, there has been an invigoration uh, of the emphasis of the health and safety of the residents. And so in addition to that, workshop in November. There was another one uh, that had a that um, expanded the scope and sleep in the home environment. And we additionally in this past December had a roundtable discussion uh, about sleep, housing, and health. And so focusing in on some of the new scientific areas that have been highlighted in the sleep plan. Uh, one, I've only chosen a, a few because our time is limited, uh, but really when we're thinking about critical and timely opportunities, uh, sleep and dementia risk, uh, the finding of the glymphatic system uh, really was groundbreaking. Uh, in addition, uh, there was another study that was published in Science in 2019 that really was focusing on uh, the oscillation or that it showed that sleep uh, is associated with this increase in interstitial fluid volume and clearance of metabolic waste. And so these two incredible findings really do open up an opportunity to elucidate the relationships between sleep circadian rhythms and the clinical dementia outcomes. Another area that we see is quite critical and timely uh, is, is the role of sleep uh, health disparities. And so in 2018, there was a workshop. Uh, the workshop report was published in 2019, and it really uh, went to develop strategies to advance sleep health disparities research. And, you know, we are especially interested in the populations uh, that are adversely affected or disadvantaged, and that includes uh, race and ethnicity, but it also includes uh, sexual and gender minorities, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, as well as underserved rural populations. Uh, although outside the context uh, of the definition of sleep health disparities, we are also still quite interested uh, in the health of women and the disparities uh, from that angle. Uh, thinking about bold predictions in the future and how we want to move this conversation forward. Uh, chronotherapy really is uh, an opportunity that could be paradigm shifting uh, for clinical practice. Uh, there was a recent paper uh, that was published that was uh, supported from our sleep and circadian, from our circadian genomics RFA uh, several years ago. Uh, this paper was published uh, last week and it spoke about the disruption of the circadian clock. Uh, resulted uh, directly in progressive heart damage that led to heart failure. And so, you know, this doesn't have to be complicated. The science is there. It's really clear. And so getting therapy at the right time of day, uh, the research has really been uh, bold and pushing this forward. And again, it really could be paradigm shifting. So developing chronotherapeutic approaches to prevent and treat chronic diseases is a bold prediction that we're making for uh, the new sleep, sleep plan and inviting the investigators to engage uh, around that topic. Another prediction is really looking at 
uh, sleep and pediatric uh, health. So good sleep is required uh, across the lifespan. We know that sleep is necessary or the research uh, has shown that research is necessary or required, uh, sleep, sorry, is required for neurodevelopment and cognitive processes, uh, maintaining healthy weight, uh, optimal health and performance trajectory. And if you don't get sleep, it really undermines uh, development and this could be a burden for life. And so one of the things that we're really interested in is the development of tools and our methods for early prediction, detection, and treatment of sleep deficiency in pediatrics and adolescents to promote health and prevent disease. And so uh, thank you all again for our stakeholders who constantly engage with us, uh, who constantly provide input and feedback because it really does uh, help inform the center and help shape our directions. And a slight plug before I, I end, uh, uh, we have our Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board meetings. Uh, they meet three times a year, the first Thursday in April, August, and December. And our next meeting will be virtual uh, April 7th uh, from noon to one noon to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for your outstanding presentation. The Department of Defense also coordinates a sleep research portfolio. These efforts advance our understanding of circadian biology and sleep and circadian sleep disorders, but also address issues like fatigue and readiness. Bolstering these effort, efforts is the fact that since the inception of the DOD peer-reviewed medical research program, Congress has included sleep as a condition eligible for study on an annual basis. DOD regularly publishes advancements from its sleep program, which aligns with NIH and other research efforts. Joining us today to provide an overview of recent progress and next steps in this area is Dr. Nita Lewis Shattuck of the Naval Postgraduate School. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shattuck. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Um, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the men and women who serve in the US military. So I have been here at the Naval Postgraduate School for the last 22 years. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the team that I lead and the work that we've, we've done to help people in the military. Whoops. So I lead a group we call the Crew Endurance Team here at the Naval Postgraduate School. And since 2001, we've conducted research on a variety of factors that impact health, performance, and readiness. Our research has had a direct impact on the Navy, resulting in mandatory policies for circadian-based watch bills. Believe it or not, for many, many years, they were not working on a 24-hour day. So when we look at where we do our research, it is truly global research. We have a laboratory here in Monterey, California, but much of our research happens across the world. Uh, we we um, look at Navy ships and submarines and aircraft carriers. We've also collected data at Recruit Training Command up at Great Lakes and at uh, West Point the uh, military academy there. We've collected data on the White House, the President's Emergency Operations Center, and U.S. embassies throughout the world. When you look at some of the ships that my team and I have collected data on, here's just, a, uh, just some photos of some of the ships and some of the sailors. Uh, we've got a lot of experience doing this, and I can tell you that uh, they're the hardest working, the most amazing people, the, the work that they do to protect us. Here is some of the data, just a, a, a quick snapshot of, of what it looks like on these ships. And uh, what you see here is down at the bottom, this is hours of sleep, average daily hours of sleep. And these are all these different ships that we collected data on. Here's the sample sizes. Bottom line is 
No one is getting eight hours of sleep, which is where this red line is, with a single exception, which is down here on a, a littoral combat ship during rough water trials. You might be able to figure out why people were getting lots of sleep because there was a lot of seasickness. But the, the story is there's not a lot of sleep. These people work incredibly long hours. There's a lot of sleep disorders and high rates of insomnia and anxiety that we see as well. The impact of our research uh, directly impacted uh, the Navy by a, a set of policies. One was the first one came out in 2017, which basically mandated that sailors would be allowed to work on a 24 hour day, which was a, a, a huge win for us. So what does my team do for the military? Basically, we provide sleep and circadian training and consultation to military commands all over the world. We respond to frequent requests from military commanders that are asking for advice. Hey, uh, we, we've got to do 24-7 operations because it never stops. I mean, the threats are out there all the time. So uh, we provide advice for them about how they can... Uh, uh, more healthily uh, schedule their people to work. When necessary, we travel to operational sites to determine how, what conditions that the, the uh, military is operating in, what conditions are amenable to change so that we can help them with that. Um, just a couple of slides here, I'm gonna talk about our current applied research. And again, most of our research is, is applied, doesn't fall in that basic uh, category, but really important work that we're looking at circadian rhythm stabilization and re realignment for shift workers. This not only applies to the military, but throughout the public. Uh, we want to uh, be able to figure out a way to reduce sleep inertia. That's that, um, it, that sluggishness that you experience, especially when awakening from deep sleep. And we're using um, high energy visible light, that blue enriched white light, to improve alertness and improve sleep as well. And um, uh, we're also talking about sleep when you're, employed, you're deployed to extreme latitudes that have long, extremely long winter nights and long summer days. So here's a study we've just completed in our lab. We're continuing to work on this. Um, and at the early morning hours of 6 December, 2018, two aircraft collided, a, a Marine Corps F-A-18 fighter and a KC-130. It was a mid-air collision and it was just in, in a, uh, they were just doing standard training and air refueling and it resulted in the loss of six aircraft or six lives and both aircraft. NPS was contacted by the headquarters of Marine Corps and said, how can, what kinds of strategies can we use to reduce this risk. And so that's what we've been doing is looking at if someone has to transition from working days to working nights, how can we do that safer and more effectively? Another study that we've been looking at, and this is with our colleagues, um, uh, both colleagues at University of South Australia and at Washington State University and at NASA, looking at uh, sleep inertia mitigation. So sleep inertia, again, that groggy feeling uh, when you awake, awaken from deep sleep. We know in the military, unanticipated events can occur anytime. So commanders, decision makers have to be sharp and have to be able to make these critical decisions. So this is something we're working on to try to give them uh, a leg up, an advantage there. And then we're also working uh, in the Arctic, we're doing a study currently looking at, at um, air crew that are doing medevac, Army medevac missions up in Fort Wainwright, uh, Alaska. And here what we're doing is looking at in these long winter nights, how can we help them by giving them artificial light to improve their alertness and their performance? Uh, again, reducing that sleep inertia when they have to awaken to, to perform these missions. So just a, a slide here about what I see as the way ahead. I think we need additional funding for applied research. We need it across the spectrum in sleep and circadian rhythms, 
but uh, I, I, I would uh, advocate for some applied research as well. We really, we need to be able to quantify and address sleep and fatigue in these operational settings, providing leaders with real-time insight into the readiness of their, their uh, warfighters is really important and allows them to make better decisions. So we need to have more evidence-based strategies to schedule these round-the-clock operations. And if we can come up with non-pharmacologic interventions to mitigate fatigue and risk, that will go a long way to, to really resolving some of the, our, our issues in the military. Again, I mentioned the sleep inertia. How do we help awaken people? We're working with some interesting thing, looking at odorants, a smell that you, the individual can, can use with that, as well as light, and stress management that uh, allows us to improve both sleep and mental health. In specific challenges that I see um, for the military sleep research, we have increasing Arctic operations. It's a critical area of study. Uh, both for the tri-service, there's a maritime strategy called Advantage at Sea, and for the Navy's Arctic strategy, which is a blue Arctic. We need multi-year funding for government and military laboratories. That'll ensure our ability to continue producing excellent cost-effective research and continuing resolutions and year-to-year -year funding really interrupt our research efforts and they hamper our ability to att attract and retain qualified personnel. So I look at those as, as specific challenges for us. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for allowing me a chance to address this group. Thank you, Dr. Shattuck, for your presentation. Joining us today to present the perspective of the stakeholder research community is Dr. Gabriel Haddad. He is Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics and Neuroscience, Vice Dean for Children's Academic Programs, and Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego. He is also the Physician-in-Chief and Chief Scientific Officer at Rady's Children's Hospital in San Diego. His research has focused on the basis for cell and tissue injury at the molecular level when tissues and organs are deprived of nutrients and oxygen. He also works with NIH on sleep research issues as a member of the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board. Dr. Haddad will be joining us via recorded presentation. I'm Dr. Gabriel Haddad from the University of California, San Diego, and the Radio Children's Hospital, San Diego. The NIH <coughs> Sleep Research Plan is a major endeavor over several years to develop a strategic plan for the National Center on Sleep Disorders with the help and input of academic leaders and healthcare providers, patient advocates, sleep research coordinating committee, and the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board. Now the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board is an advisory board to the NIH and National Sleep Center. It meets four times per year with monthly communication or virtual meetings between the National Sleep Center director and the chair of SDRAP. SDRAP had many meetings over several years at the NIH with the National Sleep Center to develop the National Sleep Research Plan. The expertise of the board is varied, and to be able to advise the National Sleep Center and the NIH, SDRAP was made up of experts in various fields of science and clinical medicine, especially that, as we know, the National Sleep Center is a trans-NIH center. The expertise of SDRAP is in many areas, including brain, mind, and behavior, lungs and airways, women's and fetal health, neonate and children, critical care, 
cardiac and vascular function, population health and sociology, and patient advocates. My own expertise and background is as follows. I have been the chair of SDRAB for the past two years, but my current position outside of SDRAB is that I'm a chair of the Department of Pediatrics and vice dean for children academic programs at the University of California, San Diego. And I'm the physician in chief and chief scientific officer at the affiliated Brady Children's Hospital, San Diego, which is the largest children's hospital in California, and I believe the seventh in the nation. My expertise is in child health and in sleep disorders in children, and in particular, obstructive sleep apnea, or, apnea or OSA. I'm interested also in the cardiovascular and neurologic conditions as a consequence of OSA, and in oxygen biology, as it pertains to the development of the brain in children. So why are all of these experts and stakeholders needed to develop the NIH sleep research plan? Well, sleep is crucial for human well-being and is so essential that it is highly conserved in the animal kingdom. Sleep, like diet or exercise, can affect all major physical and mental functions. And the respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurologic changes that occur during sleep or in certain stages of sleep are of paramount importance and can impact the well being of the individual during sleep and consequently during wakefulness. In addition, sleep disorders during pregnancy can affect fetal growth and health. There is also evidence of a genetic basis for sleep disorders. And why we sleep, what occurs when we are deprived of sleep, such as, for example, as in teenagers and adults with specific jobs and soldiers on the battlefield are major questions that are still currently being investigated. So the importance of the NIH sleep research plan derives from three reasons. The first is that it addresses many specific questions related to sleep and circulating biology and disorders. The second is that it has a highly translational value on societal health. And the third is that it addresses sleep and circadian science and health from early development to old age. It is really an exciting plan <coughs> for circadian and sleep disorders for a variety of reasons. Number one, it is really most comprehensive and timely. And it puts to use all potential tools at our disposal and the, and the disposal of sleep societies and community in 2022 and beyond to solve critical questions regarding, regarding sleep and circadian biology. But of interest, it does not stop at understanding disease only, but it seeks to develop novel therapies. Also, it does not stop at therapies, but it seeks to implement the novel therapies across populations, especially those with health disparities. It doesn't stop also at implementing uh, the novel therapies, but it keeps an eye on the future by training a diverse complement of physicians, scientists, and physician scientists to carry the mantle. We now can dream of questions and be able to solve them, unlike in the past, when we could dream, but not be able to often solve. Thank you for listening. Our final two speakers today represent one of the most important and impactful parts of the community, patient advocates. Our first patient speaker is Laura Scott Hoffman, who is participating in sharing her story on behalf of the Restless Legs Syndrome Foundation 
and community of individuals impacted by RLS. RLS is a serious debilitating disorder which embodies the need for continued advancement in research and patient care. Please join me in welcoming her. So again, I'm Laura Hoffman and I have restless leg syndrome. I'm newly on the board of the RLS Foundation. However, I've been relying on the foundation for around eight years. RLS is a neurological disease that affects roughly 12 million people in the US. There's no cure, but there are treatments to help manage it. At its simplest description, people with RLS have an overwhelming need to move their legs. This is more than discomfort. I can physically feel sick if I don't move and moving doesn't always provide relief. It's typically strongest at night. So someone with untreated RLS is unable to sleep much, which of course comes with its own set of problems. The sleep loss caused by RLS robs people of the ability to work and live normally and may lead to depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. The RLS Foundation loses members every year to suicide because their symptoms become unbearable. Provides uh, profound sleep loss, as you all know, puts people um, with RLS and other problems at risk for hypertension, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, and Alzheimer's. There's three main points I'd like to leave you with. The lack of knowledgeable doctors, the need for greater access to opioids for treatment, and the continued need for research for a cure or new treatments. So number one, there's a lack of knowledgeable doctors. It took me a year to be diagnosed. And in that year, I was exhausted and desperate. My legs kicked at night and I had severe aching in my hips and my legs, which prevented me from sleeping for any prolonged period of time. It's very hard to find doctors who know much about RLS, even sleep specialists, although they've heard of it, they often don't know how to treat it correctly. Once I was diagnosed, as many people do, I Googled RLS, and fortunately, I found the foundation, and I'm forever grateful that they are there. I depend on their collection for research, webinars, the discussion board, and more to continue to learn how to help myself. As RLS patients, we need to advocate for ourselves because we often have to educate our doctors. Number two, we need greater access to opioids, which seem to be getting even less available for us. After several years of a series of medications and combinations of medications that would stop working after a year or two, I'm currently on a low dose of methadone. Methadone in particular, but other opioids also, are the last line of defense for those of us with severe cases of RLS. I can tell you it's the only thing that gives me my quality of life and I live in fear that I can't get it. I live in Florida and I've spoken with a number of RLS patients who have moved here and then realized they can't find a doctor to treat them or to continue their opioid prescription. Many doctors are simply afraid to write them. So before I get to number three, which is research, let me give you a window into what it's like to live with RLS. RLS never goes away. I'm always aware I have it. I don't do anything at night and at home. I do things in short spurts. So if you think of reading a book or working at your computer or even sitting through this meeting today, I can't do it for longer than around 15 minutes without great discomfort. I lead the RLS Foundation's virtual support group meetings periodically, which are open to anyone who chooses to attend. The foundation holds them four times a month on Zoom. There are always people on the call that are exhausted from lack of sleep. It's especially heartbreaking to listen to people who are unable to find medical help. In their desperation, they turn to the RLS Foundation. So number three, and lastly, uh, continued research is needed for a cure or better treatments. To date, there are no RLS-specific treatments that are lifelong. 
Increased funding is critical so that RLS researchers can identify causes and develop new treatments leading to symptom management and ultimately a cure. There are too many people suffering in silence. I thank you all for giving me a chance to talk about it today. Many people don't wanna to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Our second patient speaker and our final speaker for today is Alexandra Wharton. Alexandra represents the Circadian Sleep Disorders Network or CSDN community and also works closely um, with NCSDR in her role as a member of the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board. Alexandra's personal journey and ongoing involvement with NIH and the community provided with a unique perspective on the value and importance of research. Please join me in welcoming her. My name is Alexandra Wharton, and I'm here today to talk about delayed sleep wake phase disorder. Um, that stands for, uh, I'll be calling it DSPD for this presentation. I've suffered from it since I was eight years old and it runs in my family. My grandfather, father, sister have all been extreme night owls. And I'm advocating for increased awareness and research for circadian rhythm sleep disorders, which includes DSPD. I'm a board member of the Circadian Sleep Disorders Network and I'm a chapter leader for Texas for Start School Later and I'm thrilled to be part of NIH's SDRAB. DSPD is a type of circadian rhythm disorder that causes a person's internal body clock to be delayed by four hours, although that can range. It's an intractable condition and it can't be adjusted through self-discipline or willpower. This can be very difficult for typical sleepers to understand. The, it's not that rare, about one in 600 adults has it, that's half a million Americans and one in 75 uh, people have a variant of the CRY1 gene that's been shown to cause DSPD in humans. Unfortunately, even today, clinicians misdiagnose DSPD patients with chronic insomnia, believing they have depression or anxiety, and that's what causes their inability to fall asleep earlier. And it's not just misdiagnosed, but it's also mistreated. So first-line treatments such as chronotherapy can turn DSPD into non-24, which is even worse. Um, antidepressants like SSRIs may disrupt this, our circadian rhythms and hypnotics like Ambien can lead to dependency. So more awareness of DSPD is desperately needed. Technology is not required to track one sleep patterns. You can print out a two week sleep log from the internet and take it to a doctor or hopefully a sleep specialist. Um, and when a patient complains that they can't fall asleep until four o'clock in the morning every night, despite following every sleep hygiene tip out there, um, a circadian rhythm disorder should, should be considered. Unfortunately, even today, that's still not happening. Um, furthermore, melatonin and cortisol can be tracked in a person over a 24 hour period. Um, and that can also show that a person is indeed a late chronotype. There are several neurological and metabolic conditions that are comorbid with delayed sleep, such as autism, diabetes, dementia, obesity. Uh, in fact, 80% of ADHD cases in children report having delayed sleep. Um, it's two sides of the same coin. And it makes sense to me, it's energy at the wrong time of the day. An MRI finds that a night owl's prefrontal cortex remains in a disabled offline state until the late morning. For typical sleepers, environmental cues set their body clock. So that's like light exposure, meal times, social activities, body temperature. But these cues are not effective for people with DSPD. There's something else going on. And so there's a lot of research happening right now. You know, is it a deficiency in a certain type of retinal ganglion cell? Does a person have a longer intrinsic circadian period? Um, does the person lack the um, buildup of sleep throughout the day so that they're not tired at night? Um, and there's no magic bullet for DSPD. Treatments include light therapy, melatonin, melatonin agonists, 
and it works for some people. Um, but the best treatment right now is an accommodated schedule. To develop more effective treatments, we need to understand the physiological underpinnings of, of DSPD. And there is some hope on the horizon. The Nobel Prize winners uh, in 2017 um, were body clock researchers. And among the many things they're investigating is how various mammals' biorhythms sync to the rotation of the earth and finding that you know, some people have a 22 hour long clock, some people have a 27 or mammals long clock. Um, there's also a blood test currently called time signature that calculates a person's circadian phase. It is not yet clinically available, um, but when it is, I think it'll be a real game changer in diagnosing DSPD and CRDs. Um, in addition to the CRY1 gene that I mentioned earlier, which stands for cryptochrome, there are other gene variants that have been implicated in causing delayed sleep, such as of the clock gene and per gene. And there are researchers all around the world working on this at UCSF, UCSC. Um, that was an exciting announcement from the University of Oldenburg the other day. I don't have time to get into all that, but <laughs> in the meantime, um, I'm working and Circadian Sleep Disorders Network is working to you know, reassess our nine to five society. Um, our daily schedules are still based on an agrarian economy. However, only 1% of the US population works in agriculture. Work tasks for most uh, do not require sunlight. Companies should offer flex time. Um, the pandemic has demonstrated that the world doesn't fall apart when people have adjusted schedules. Uh, employers could increase productivity by aligning workers' schedules with their body clocks, um, which they did in a, in a factory in Germany very successfully in the last few years. Um, and employees, of course, would benefit from having better physical and mental health because they'd be working when they feel their best. Um, schools should start later. The Start School Later movement advocates for starting schools later. There's 138 chapters now worldwide with healthy hours legislation in several states. In South Texas, there are districts that start at 6.55 a.m. with bus pickup time at 5.45 a.m. Of course, this leads to absenteeism, truancy. You know, a lot of kids just end up dropping out of high school because of the start time. Um, in we had two bills in the last three. Excuse me. We had two bills in the last three years um, for legislation for starting school later, or at least studying the benefits of starting school later. And I'm confident that we will have one at the next legislative session. Um, and in conclusion, uh, I'm working with many, many other people to increase awareness of DSPD, that it is not a psychological condition, but a physiological one, um, to improve diagnosis and treatment, to help people seek accommodations at work and school, and finally, to reduce the stigma of having a later chronotype. Thank you, Ms. Wharton. On behalf of the SRS and the Sleep Circadian Sleep Disorders Research and Patient Communities, thank you again for joining us for this briefing. We are all excited about recent progress and the new direction charted by the Sleep Research Plan. We hope we can continue to count on your support for sleep research efforts to ensure that federal research continues to receive meaningful funding so that innovative emerging activities can be fully implemented. Have a great day and thank you again for attending.